بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه الطاهرين ما دام ما في السماوات والأرضين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم إنا نسألك علما ينفعنا ورفعنا اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا ورزقا واسعا وعملا متقبلا وشفاء من كل دا وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله we thank and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of his blessings that he has bestowed upon us and we beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in those blessings وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you endeavor to count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will not be able to do so we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he enable us to be grateful for his blessings with the idea of maintaining those blessings. Um, I was thinking that to start off uh, this evening, I had come across a, a very famous uh, narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. It's known as the narration of Jibreel. And we are quite familiar with that particular narration. Uh, it talks about uh, Umar radiallahu anhu says that Baina or Bainama, there are two wordings to the narration. Nahnu inda Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, idh jaa'a rajulun. We were in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and it happened to be in the mosque, a house of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and a person came upon us. And this particular person, as is explained later, would be none other than Jibreel alayhi sallam. Um, and then they describe the form in which he came in. So Jibreel is an angel. And one of the uh, peculiarities of angels, one of the idiosyncrasies about angels is they can take on different forms. So they are made of light. They are subtle beings that are made up of light. And they have this prodigal strength and ability. And one of the abilities that they have is they can take on different forms. So Jibreel alayhi salam, generally he would take on the form of uh, a companion by the name of Dihya Al-Kalbi. But that doesn't mean he only took on that particular form. Because in this narration, Jibreel comes and they don't recognize him, uh, even in terms of his outer form. And it's amazing how our scholars actually explain that the angels, they're made up of light. Um, then there's a sort of a contraction of uh, this light that makes up their beings. Now when you contact this particular light and then they're given a form of a solid form and that's how you have an angel appearing as a person. So nevertheless the angel comes into the company of the Prophet and he comes in a particular way and this is what <coughs> relates to our class. So Jibreel, he comes in two forms really. He's filling two roles. He comes as a student and he comes as a teacher as well because we will come to discover the dynamics of the narration. So whatever he does would serve as the etiquette for a student and also serve as the etiquette for a teacher. So the first thing they mention is that uh, he greets when he comes in. So we find our scholars differ. Sometimes when you come into a class, you don't know what to do. Look, do I greet and like disturb the peace? Or do I just take my place at the back of the, of the classroom? I found that the etiquette of scholars differed in that particular regard. Some would insist that when you come in, that you greet, and they would stop even in mid-sentence and respond to you, to your greeting. So Jibreel comes and he says, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So our scholars infer there from that when you're greeting even a single person, you use the plural form, Assalamu alaikum. He doesn't say Assalamu alayka. Um, and then there's a unique thing about why would you say Assalamu alaikum? So the one understanding would be the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you use the plural. And normally when you use the plural for a single entity, it's for aggrandizing, ta'zim. And you can understand that. But there's another interesting explanation in as far as why did Jibreel say, Assalamu alaikum ya Muhammad, he's greeting a single person. They say it is cons in consideration of the angels surrounding a person. You know, when we, when we conclude our prayer, then we say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Who are we greeting? We are greeting all of those fellow um, uh, uh, worshippers on our right and all of our fellow worshippers on our left. And our scholars are quick to include that you're greeting the angels also. All the angels to your right and all the angels to your, to your left. 
So this is one of the etiquette in terms of us coming to a gathering of, of learning and teaching. And when we when we we reading in terms of Mataratul Kulub, Fakultu Badi and Bikalbil Bidi. I'm starting by turning around the word bid'i, which comes to adab, which is etiquette. So we come into a class every Tuesday by the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we attend many other classes. Whatever classes we do attend, it is important to adhere to this particular etiquette. And then the other etiquette is that they say that kana shadidu bayad al thiyabi, shadidu sawadi sha'ri, la yura alayhi asaru safari. His clothes were starkingly white. And he had a pitch black beard. Um, we didn't recognize him. That's quite strange because he's in Medina. And then you wouldn't see the effects of traveling on him as well. So who is this? It's none other than Jibreel السلام, coming in a human form. So our scholars mind certain etiquette. So they say when you, when, you, when you come to a class, Jibreel is coming as a student. So how is he coming? He's dressed in white. Therefore Ibn Hajr uh, al-Haytami recommends that when you come into a class of learning, that ideally if you're able to, then you dress in white, like Jibreel, because he came as a student and he was dressed in, in white. But the important thing is, whichever color you're going to uh, adorn yourself with, the important point is the adornment. That coming to a class is an occasion. You know, when we go to a particular oca occasion, then we dress appropriately. So when coming to a class also, it's a, it's a, it's a Jibreel, when he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Shadidu Badal Thiyab. You know, it was starkly white. In other words, it was very a clean and almost, excuse me, um, clean to a point that it was actually striking. And then it is also said that when you come to a class, he appeared to be very striking. So the our outward appearance should be um, striking. And how do you how do you have a striking appearance? Is basically what we'd refer to colloquially when you clean up. You know, the the the, the, the Arabic text says by removing like excesses. In other words, you trim your beard, you trim your mustache. You come presented like Jibreel السلام, presented himself to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So uh, other, than, other than the Eid celebration, where we are recommended to wear colors because it's a festivity. And a festivity is augmented by the colorfulness, even in terms of our, of our clothing. So Eid is recommended to, to wear colors. But when it comes to class, even Jumu'ah, it, it, it's not, it's a festivity in a certain sense, but it's more a religious um, communal worship and gathering. So therefore it's recommended that we come in, that we come in in white. So these are some of the etiquettes I thought that I just read about it now very recently and then I thought we'd share because we are sharing in this experience of learning and, and teaching. And one of the, the, very, uh, uh, the very outstanding lessons that we learned from Jibreel alayhi salam was the manner in which he approached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. The Prophet ﷺ is his teacher in this particular regard, in a unique way. Because he asks the Prophet ﷺ a question, the Prophet ﷺ answers, and then he says, Sadaqta. The companions are like, you ask a question, he receives an answer, and then he affirms the answer. Why are you asking in the first place? Uh, are you with me? So he's a unique type of student and, and teacher in a certain sense. Because the Prophet ﷺ says afterwards, at right, right at the end, Ja'akum yu'allimukum deenakum. He came to teach you your, your religion. The interesting thing, which I think it's important for us to highlight, um, uh, Alisa, interesting for us to highlight, is that when Jibril came in, he came right up until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa alihi wa sallam. You know, I'm remembering the, the narration now. <laughs> so, you know, the, uh, this is basically the, the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting, and Jibril Asim came closer. In one narration, it says that Jibril asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Adunu. You know, should I come closer? So then the Prophet says to him, Udnu, come closer. And as he's moving closer, he, he like stops, as if he's walking very haltingly towards the Prophet And then every now and then he says, Adnu, should I come closer? So you can understand the type of mutual respect that is being had by the Archangel, Jibreel, and the Prophet So every now and then, like he's walking slowly, he says, Adnu, and then, you know, the Prophet says to him, Udnu, Udnu come closer, come closer. Up until he comes right to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he, he puts his knees to the knees of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yeah? and then he puts, his, um, uh, he puts his hands, if I remember correctly, on the, on the thighs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this talks about a relationship that was already established. There's a great familiarity between Jibreel and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there our scholars highlight something very important. 
because Jibril is coming um, to facilitate purpose of understanding. He's coming and he comes to the Prophet ﷺ very confidently to a point that he puts his knees to the knees of the Prophet ﷺ. He puts his hands on the thighs of the Prophet ﷺ and he asks him a few questions. They talk about the etiquette of the questioner. When you ask something, you must ask confidently. And if you look at it, Jibreel is coming to the Prophet ﷺ. You and I, you know, if, if we were in the company of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, we, you know, we would manifest uh, humbleness and humility. But here you have a seeker, and he's coming to ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So what happens is, he asked a question. But he does it so, بِقُوَّةِ us very confidently. So Ibn Hajar highlights there, that a student, when you ask, number one is, if you have a question, you must ask the question. And when you have the question, you must answer, ask it confidently. And they say that whilst you're asking the question, you shouldn't be preoccupied with anything else that may, you know, obfuscate your question. You must be very clear and confident in terms of the question. And then the person who's being asked, he must look at the question and answer the question and he mustn't preoccupy himself with whether um, the correct propriety was maintained or not. Like in the, in the case of Jibreel, because you could question, Jibreel is coming right up to the Prophet Sallallahu and almost like brazen. Now sometimes a person asks you a question, you may misinterpret it as being brazen, but the person needs to ask a question, is asking the question, you know, out front. So I think it's an important point for us because many times we take issue and exception when somebody is asking us a question, but they ask the question in a particular manner. And that could inadvertently, when somebody asks us a question, they don't mean any impropriety, but we're quick to cut them off. It inhibits, it, it discourages people from asking questions. You know, you can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can address the issue of the manner that you ask the question at a later stage, but Actually, as a question, many times we in a class and you find, no, I can't ask so-and-so that question. You know, because you, you consider it, that's going to be, um, it's going to come across as um, arrogant, perhaps. But there's a thin line between confidence and arrogance. We know that. So when you have a question and you need to ask the question, you must safeguard against arrogance. But you must confidently ask your question. I have a question. And if you look at the at Jibreel with the with the Prophet, the companions also. They would ask the Prophet. And sometimes if they didn't get the right answer, they would remonstrate with the Prophet. And that is part and parcel of the etiquette of learning and, and teaching. Uh, and that is really one of the points that I wanted to I wanted, wanted to mention. May Allah SWT grant us the understanding. Now. And our scholars say Jibreel is sat in this way that I'm sitting now in Tashahud. So they advise that when you start off, then you start sitting in this particular manner. But not all of us can maintain this. Some of us can't even start off by sitting in this particular way. And it's not something which is compulsory, it's something which is recommended. But as the lesson goes on, and then you change. And then when you, when you realize again, and then you come to this position. And through these etiquettes, inshallah, Allah will facilitate for our, for our learning. So we're going to get into our, into our lesson today, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And last week, we sort of like, you know, uh, 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 chopped and changed uh, things around a bit. And uh, uh, perhaps we should just maintain the order of the book this week, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, there are a few important uh, points which the author mentions here. And my understanding of the text is that he speaks to this whole idea of um, emotional intelligence. He speaks to the idea of emotional intelligence. If you have emotional intelligence, you are able to make the right decisions. If you don't have emotional intelligence, you're unable to make the right decisions. It, it, um, it impairs your decision-making ability. If you don't have emotional intelligence, it impairs your decision-making ability. Uh, let's look at an emotion, for example, the emotion of anger. So we look at a, 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 a judge. There's a narration that the Prophet ﷺ says that no one should pass judgment if he's angry. Because when you anger and you overcome with anger and you make a decision, then a decision which you make, it's impaired. What is it impaired by? It's impaired by your emotional state. What is your emotional state? Your emotional state is a state of anger. It's one of the easy examples to use because we can relate to it quite well empirically. Um, what is anger? How is anger described as? They say, wa The first part of anger is insanity. 
and the last part of anger is regret. On average, this is basically what happens. There's an interesting question when it talks about in a Sharia court, and by the grace and mercy of Allah SWT, we have a judiciary, we have actually, actually have a running court. So you find a judge sitting there. So he gets angry. You can get angry for one of two reasons. The one is when you get angry for the sake of Allah. You're listening to a case, and you look at the transgression against the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it angers you. So the reason for your anger, is it justified or not justified? It's justified. So they ask the question that if you anger, but justifiably so, can you still pass judgment? Because nobody can question your anger now. Because you're getting angry for the right reason. And sometimes uh, we don't know how to manage our anger. Anger is a, is a is human quality that can be harnessed and used positively. If you didn't get angry for anything, then you'd be a walkover. So anger is not a quality that must be effaced. Anger is a quality that must be managed. And within an Islamic paradigm, we have this idea of getting angry for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The law of Allah is being violated. And you know the consequence of violating the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that either a, 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 a benefit is pushed away from you or a harm is going to befall you. So a person gets angry because of that reason. Point being here that if you're getting angry, angry for a justifiable reason and you now find yourself in a state of anger, in other words, there's an emotion imbalance now, the fact that the anger is justified, does that mean that the decision is going to be a balanced decision? Our scholars say no. If you get angry, whether you get angry for a justifiable reason or not, anger in and of itself, it impedes your judgment. And therefore, you shouldn't be passing judgment in that particular state. Uh, uh, you're with me. So, the, 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 my understanding of the idea, what the author is trying to bring across now is that you must have emotional intelligence. In other words, all of your emotions must be in balance. And when your emotions are in balance, and now through that balanced state, you look at things, you're able to see things as they are. And you won't have a warped appreciation of what's happening in, in front of you. Come on. So now, the, the, the scholars basically talk to this particular idea. What do they say? They say, وَكُلُّ مِن تَمْوِيلْ إِنسَانَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ وَخِدَاعِي لِأَقْلِي يَحْجُبُ عَنُهُ الْوُصُولِ إِلَى الْحَقِّ uh, are, He basically says, when a person deceives himself, so he, he's, he's looking at a particular phenomenon, and he is deceiving himself in the process of evaluating this particular phenomenon. So he deceives himself. It's called in Arabic, tamwil uh, insan ala nafsi. This he's deceiving himself, present prevents him from seeing the truth in something. Okay. So now this thing it, it confused me, man. Uh, this this concept because it's actually a it's actually a terminology that they use. Because if I were to translate the word tamwil insan, it gives me a particular literal translation that I'm quite familiar with. But that can clearly not be the intent over here. So what is, what is meant here? That when a person looks at something, but he's in a particular psychological state. What is that psychological state? So the English equivalent for tamwil nafs, a person deceiving himself, takes on the following form. And I'm going to read it to you. The one is... Uh, self-deception. What is self-deception? Self-deception is um, the act of convincing oneself of something that is not true, often to justify one's actions or beliefs. So that's the, I think that's uh, the, 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 the first one, self-deception. You're self-deceiving yourself by looking at things in a way that uh, uh, harmonizes with your base desires. So you're deceiving yourself. You tell yourself it's good, but in reality it's actually bad. So you are deceiving yourself. So self-deception is the one thing. And I think even the West has these terminologies that they, that they use. The second one in terms of tamwi nafs is cognitive dissonance. You do something, but you're very uncomfortable in doing it. But in order to remove the discomfort, you justify and you rationalize it. So what's happening in all of what we're doing now? Remember from an Islamic perspective, what is the solution? We know the solution is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have a divine morality. Allah says this is right and it's right. Allah says this is wrong, this is wrong. So if you want to determine what is correct and what is incorrect, you simply look at what Quran says is correct and what is incorrect, what the Prophet says is correct and what is incorrect, 
that is guidance. Um, the moment yourself, you enable yourself to make a moral judgment on something, that's where the problem comes in. And he's going to explain in a bit now that you as a person, he gives a similitude, um, mannerisms that you adopt and that you don't adopt. It's very much like when you find yourself on the table and there's a number of dishes in front of you. Your hand is going to extend to what, what dishes? The ones that you desire, the ones that you covet. And the ones that you don't covet and don't desire, your hand is not going to reach out to that. Similarly, as a person, as a person, there are certain actions. Which actions are you going to adopt and which actions are you not going to adopt? Like when you're on the table, you're going to take the food you like and you're going to leave the food you don't like. Likewise, in terms of behavior, you're going to adopt the behavior that you, that you, that you like and you're not going to adopt the behavior that you don't like. Now, maybe there's a behavior that you don't like, but that behavior is actually good for you. So what happens, uh, why don't you adopt that particular behavior? Because of these issues mentioned, self, what's it called, self-deception, cognitive dissonance. Another one is uh, denial, and it gets worse, you can go even into, into delusion. So this is, the, this is the, the self. So what's going to happen is, in your mind, the author uh, explains, he says, what happens is, um, you don't engage with those things that you don't want to engage with on an intellectual level. So what type, of, uh, what type of approach is this? This is the approach of denial. You just ignore that. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of an example. Um, uh, this happened at, uh, like, you know, I have to mention the name because it's not a critique in the least. Uh, I had the good fortune of teaching at Darun Naim for about 10 years. <coughs> right? So what happens is, um, after the first term, you start working through the Qur'an. Right? So what does Qur'an do? Qur'an reforms. So as the class goes on, you find the students, they are basically reforming. Somehow or the other, you know, uh, students get a, a preview of the verses that are coming ahead. You know? Like they say, come into a theater near you. Then they say, come into a class near you. So now in Surah to Nisa, the chapter dealing with women folk, the chapter dealing with women folk, there's a verse that talks about wal It talks about girlfriends taking on boyfriends. But obviously it applies the other way around. Boyfriends taking girlfriends. So the students in class, what they do is they tell one another, when is that verse going to be taught in the class near you? Then they stay absent that day. They come in the next day. This is, not, I'm not, this is factual. Students, here's a student from Darun Naim. I don't know if they did it in your years. But consciously students say, look here, that verse will come that day. I still have a girlfriend. Look, I'm in the process of reforming, but this is a bit too much, too quick. <laughs> you, you're with me? So I'm going to stay absent that day. You, you, What's the difference between that when I'm sitting on a table and now you're giving me the honey, you give me the olives. So I choose the honey because it's sweet. I don't want to choose olives because it's got bitter taste. So my hand extends to that which I... But you, you, you don't know. Perhaps in the consumption of olives that you so much dislike is actually very good for you. I found with kids also generally, the foods that they actually have an aversion to is actually what they need the most. For example, like fish with the omega-3s and omega-6s. Those of our kids that actually need it the most, they dislike it the most. So they don't, they don't take that when it's on the table. So what's the difference between that and now, in terms of your behavior, your behavior is very much like you're sitting on a table, laden with goods, you're an extent to that which you like, and what you don't like, you're going to stay away. What happens with, in terms of behavior, what does our self do? Your self appropriates that behavior which is up its alley, so to say, and it doesn't appropriate that behavior which is not up its alley. So that's the... That's the fundamental point which the author is making, is making over, over here. But he goes on and explains it very beautifully because you'll find that um, you can, it's like you can, you can, you can, you can run away, but you can't hide. So the truth is quite tenacious as well. You can ignore the truth, you can cover up the truth, but, and you can run away from the truth, 
but like as if you can't hide away from the from the truth. The truth has this unique way of um, haunting you, so to say, man. That, that you can't run away from it. So when you make a decision and you make the wrong decision and you do that, you'd find as you go along, you know, you you like uh, these clips out there, like currently now, that the genocide we won't forget. And what are people cursing the Israelis with? May the genocide haunt you. Because at the end of the day, you're still a human being. And even if you have a semblance of humanity left within you, this what you did is still going to haunt you. Uh, so human beings, the way Allah wants to be created them, they do have this propensity for, for goodness. But he explains it now in a beautiful way, and he says, um, so when your self deceives you from uh, opting for things which are difficult, but you know it's difficult, but the outcome is actually a good outcome. It's, it's actually better for you to, to do that. Um, uh, another example would be like exercise. Exercise. It, it, when you're given an option, I'm just going to hang around at home on the couch, or I'm actually going to go for a walk. What option choice do you make? You, yourself, you know, you know deep down that the right choice is for you too. And now you say, I'm tired. And then they tell you, if you're tired, there's all the more reason for you to go out to actually exercise. So you know in terms of outcome that, as opposed to sitting on the couch, exercising is better. But what decision do you make? You make the decision to sit on your laurels. Uh, it's just another example of how, but now if it comes to your mind, for example, the Prophet says there's two benefits that men are very negligent about. And what are they? Your time and your, and your health. So now you know you need to look after yourself, and that's your incentive to, to get up. It might be difficult, but the outcome is going to be going to be good. So at the point when you when you are supposed to make that particular decision, um, you make the wrong decision, but uh, you don't find peace of mind. But then the the, the you know the, the the all of the proofs that should have gotten you to do the right thing, those proofs it basically almost like wants you. That's what the 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 the. the, the, the the, the author is, is, is saying. But he says there comes a time where because of the human condition, then the, your sensibilities, it gains the upper hand at the end of the day. And he gives an example in terms of Quran. And the example would be, وَجَرَيْنَا <laughs> That even people that they deny the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they find themselves on a ship and they find themselves in the middle of the ocean and they are going to, you know, they turn in, at that particular point in time, who do they turn to? All their life they were denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at that point in time, what, what reality dawns upon them? That only one can save us and that is none other than, than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So despite the fact that they've made all of the wrong choices throughout, at that particular point in time, what happens? Sanity prevails. And then what happens is, they come to the realization that there is no uh, deity worthy of worship. There is no savior besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, that's the first part of, 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 of today's discussion. Is everybody okay with it? It's, it's clear and it's, it was, it's, quite a, it was quite difficult for me to <laughs> wrap my head around this concept. Um, and I think you sort of understand the concept. More or less, inshallah, bi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Uh, so this is the one concept he, he talks about. Um, and then I'm going to mention very, like, ad hoc, the, the last concept that he, that he talks about. So it's basically being conscious about the self and not having too much reliance on the self. Because yourself is prone to err. And the self is prone to make those decisions which benefits itself which may have a short-term benefit but a long-term harm. At the end of the day, my understanding is that we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we follow the, the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which will bring us, even though sometimes um, initially it appears to be a harm, but long-term absolutely uh, we, stand to, we stand to benefit if we lead our lives, not according to our base whims and fancies, but according to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is my, my understanding. Then he talks about, so he talks about the self being uh, deceptive. And then he talks about the, your, your, your intellect also being deceptive. And then he distinguishes, and we'll end off on this particular point, inshallah, in terms of our reading. Um, on, he says, for worldly matters, 
uh, you require a certain degree of intelligence. But then for religious matters, you, you require a different form of intelligence. And it doesn't necessarily mean that a person has intelligence vis-a-vis vis ephemeral matters, material matters, worldly matters, that that person necessarily has the required intelligence to understand religious matters. It's a different type of intelligence. So he brings an argument, and his argument is as follows. He works up to a particular argument. But before I mention that argument, he quotes proof from the Quran. So in Surah Al Rum, there's a very, um, there's a very well known and oft quoted verse. Allah talks about the disbelievers, and what does He say about them? Ya alamuna, zahiram min al ardi, o zahiram min al hayati dunya. They know the apparent of this worldly life. Yeah? وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ مُغَافِلُونَ But they are unmindful of the year after. So when Allah SWT acknowledges that they know about worldly matters, but they are unmindful of the year after. So you would think that, you know, if a person is intelligent in a worldly way, that that necessarily must amount to him being intelligent in a religious way. It's not necessary. It's, a person might be very proficient in terms of worldly affairs, but he doesn't have the intelligence to... Um, when we talk about intelligence, we talk about it in a, in a very holistic sense, not just the intellectus as such. Uh, Wallah, and Allah knows best. So it doesn't mean that you're intelligent in a worldly sense, that you're necessarily intelligent um, in an otherworldly sense, in a religious sense. Hassan al-Basri, he was, he, was, he, was, he, was he was asked about certain things. He says, لا يبلغ من حذك أحد بأمر دنيا أنه يقلب درهم على ظفره فيخبرك بوزنه. So Hassan al-Basri, talking about expertise at that particular time. He says that you give somebody a, is it a dirham? So a dirham, um, dirham would be a silver coin. So you give it to the person and he basically takes it on his finger. He places the silver coin on his finger. And by the mere placement, he can tell you the weight. And he, he, in other words, he can give you a measure of uh, you know, the, 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 the silver coin. He can give you exactly the measure. And, you, and if you go to a scale, you'll find that it was on point. So Hassan al-Basri says that. So is he intelligent in terms of worldly matters? Yes. But then he says, وَمَا يُحْسِنُ يصلي. But he doesn't have the ability to pray. He's so intelligent in terms of worldly affairs. So in other words, it's a different type of intelligence that you, that you require. So the point really being that sometimes we put so much uh, dependence on our intelligence that we feel that the in, your intelligence, number one, your intelligence is not even transitive. In other words, it can't go beyond one thing to another thing. And this is the second point that he mentions. He talks about uh, intelligence. He says intelligence is really limited to the time and the circumstances that you find yourself in. Because what can be considered as intelligent in one era, in the era following that, that same thing which was viewed as intelligence within that area is now viewed as, and he goes on to say, and he apologizes for it, and he says, could very well be referred to as stupidity. But in its era, it was intelligence. So intelligence doesn't even need to go beyond an era. Something happening now in our time can be the most intelligent thing for us to do. But people in the next era, when they look back at that, they, they dumbfounded how could they have actually done that? Because in the retrospect, it appears to be the most foolhardy thing for people to have ever done. But at that time, it was the most intelligent thing. So a big part of what is happening is that to inform us about our own limitations. And when we understand our limitations, Rahimallah Imran Allah have mercy on a person that realizes his limits and he stops at his limit. And we said, yes, you have intelligence, but your intelligence is limited. And where the limit of your intelligence reaches, that's where the beginning of revelation begins. So that's basically our understanding of, of knowledge as such. And Allah SWT knows, knows best. So when he establishes that, he tells you, so if intelligence doesn't even go beyond one period, we want to be as presumptuous now as to do what? Our limited intelligence that doesn't even survive beyond one period. Leave it at one period. Your own intelligence doesn't actually survive and go beyond one phase of your life. In this particular phase, based on your intelligence, you made a particular decision. Ten years later, when you look back at that decision, you would never have made the same decision. So your intelligence doesn't even go, go beyond one phase of your own very existence. So his argument now is that that limited intelligence, what do you want to do with it? You use that and apply it to the world. You may do so successfully, but now you want to take the same intelligence and what do you want to do? You want to, you want to apply it to matters of the unseen. In other words, you want to govern Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by your limited intelligence. 
And I think maybe sometimes in, in, in almost understandable and innocent ways we actually do that because maybe we're exposed to a certain way things run, um, certain laws, worldly laws, and we can actually understand the sense they're in. Let's, let's think of an example. Riba. Riba. Um, if I were to ask you to justify Riba, would you be able to do so? From a purely worldly point of view. The whole world is run in an interest-based system. It must make some sense. So what's the sense? The sense is that, look, um, I have, a, I have, a, I have 100,000 rands. I lend it to you, you borrow it from me. So for as long as I don't have access to that 100,000 rands, I'm losing out. There's, an, there's a lost opportunity cost. And because of that lost opportunity, you must remunerate me for it. So you remunerate me for it. That is the intelligence. Do we, do we, do we acknowledge it? We acknowledge it. But we're saying there's a higher intelligence. And that is the intelligence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala categorically, not only, not only uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, 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 in as far as the Qur'an is concerned, but all the spaciations before us have outlawed interest. And if you, if you read into it, you will understand that there's a higher intelligence at play because whatever benefit, apparent benefit, that your limited intelligence applies to uh, uh, exacting interest, uh, it pales in comparison to the harms that it causes and the benefits from staying away from interest altogether. As an example of, you know, again, a higher intelligence. And the, 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 the Sharia is not meant not to make sense to us. It's basically just to help us understand that we have an intelligence, but the Sharia represents a higher form of intelligence, which is the greatest intelligence, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for us to understand and appreciate, and appreciate that, and not be uh, presumptuous about our own abilities and, and so forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best. So, and the last issue, so these are things which I mentioned ad hoc, uh, but inshallah in next week's lesson, I will mention the middle part, which I'm still uh, reading and wrapping my head around, bi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then we'll piece everything together and we'll move on to the next chapter. So this chapter basically deals with the limitations of the human's capacity. And it actually started off by saying, how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a limited lifespan and he gives us a complete intellect? Because if he were to give us complete intellect with an, with an extended lifespan, then knowing the human condition, that would lead to transgression. That was basically last week's discussion. So the whole discussion is, 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 is framed in the limited ability of the human intelligence as, as such. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best. Allah grant us the tawfiq, inshallah, and grant us understanding. Barakallahu fikum. So we will read a little bit of the Mataratul Qulub, um, purification of the heart. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates for the purification of, of our hearts, inshallah. So the text reads, Fa'adab, so we're busy with etiquette. And we've, last week we spoke about you know, the importance of etiquette and I always love to revisit these sayings because uh, of the scholars they said that نَحْنُ إِلَىٰ قَلِيلٍ مِنَ الْأَدَبْ أَحْوَجْ مِنَّا إِلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ We are more in need of a little bit of etiquette than what we are in need of a lot of knowledge. So, you know, uh, etiquette, like we always uh, quote uh, the Urdu saying is بَأَدَبْ بَأَنَسِيب بَأَدَبْ بَأَنَسِيب If you have etiquette you have everything. If you don't have etiquette you don't have anything. Uh, those people, and we spoke about it last week also, generally, you know, and this is almost like an unwritten thing in terms of a CV. You know, when you come and you're applying for a job, what do people really look at? They really look at your etiquette. Your qualifications are important, but of equal importance, if not of more importance, is, you know, uh, what type of team player are you, you know, etc., etc., etc. So this basically all comes down to, to etiquette. So there's a statement also that Abu Bakr ad Nuri said, that person who has raised in status and come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not because of a lot of prayer um, or a lot of fasting or a lot of charity, but the only reason why they've actually gained proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is because of etiquette and good character. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us this. So the book now starts off by mentioning those characteristics that we should embellish ourselves with. So he starts off by saying, فَأْدَبْ أَمْرٌ مِّنْ أَدَبًا كَضَرَفَ أي تأدب مع الله على وجل وذلك بأن تلازم الحياة 
So the first quality he mentions is that you must have etiquette with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what etiquette should you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said you should have this quality of haya. You should have this quality of haya. My understanding of the word Mataratul Qulub or the book Mataratul Qulub is that the poem is designed in a way that follows the alphabet, the Arabic alphabet. So you notice that Ha comes very early. Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha, Jim, Ha. So, you know, he's going to mention the qualities alphabetically. That's my understanding of the, of the text. So Ha comes very early on. So he's talking about Haya. So it's not a matter of um, importance. Uh, look, Adab is the most important thing that's why it started with, 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 with Adab as such. But also it starts with the, the Hamza. You know, Adab. Bada'a, he turned it around so it becomes Adab. So it's also quite early on if you wanted to look at the Hamza as an Alif, which is technically speaking incorrect. But, I mean, uh, so Haya. So what is Haya? And this is also a very important uh, part of the book because what they do is they give you a quality and so if I were to ask you what is haya, you're going to give me a translation. You're going to tell me haya means bashfulness or it means modesty, which is all correct. But if I were to ask you what is bashfulness, what is modesty? You could argue that, um, and this is a valid argument, um, that it's axiomatically known. I don't need to provide you with a definition of modesty because all of us recognize what modesty is. When you see a person behaving modesty, Modestly, you don't need a teacher to point out to you that that behavior that you're witnessing now, that's called modesty. Intuitively, you know that's modesty. That's just the natural disposition of, of it. But it's also, you could argue in that way, but the scholars, when they talk about these qualities, they actually define it. And it's really beautiful how they define it, because sometimes uh, these issues become a little bit obscured in our minds. You know, the quality of, of modesty. What is it all about? What is higher? So he says that there's a literal definition of, 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 of haya. So he says, literally it refers to taghayyurun. It's a change, modesty, bashfulness. Um, uh, what happens when somebody gets shy? What happens to them? They turn red in the face. And sometimes we laugh because sometimes it, even a darker complexion person, then you know, they turn red. But it's like, how does a dark of, com dark of complexion person turn red? You'll see when they, when they, when they, when they, you know, when they shy, right? So it's taghayyurun. Literally, what does uh, modesty, bashfulness means? Taghayyurun, a change. Ya'atar uh, al-insan, that overcomes a person. So modesty, this condition of modesty, is a change that overcomes a person. When does it overcome him? Min khawfi ma yu'abu bi. When he's apprehensive of that, of, of, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a fault being attributed to him. Or something which is not, uh, like, palatable. So a person turns red in the face. Why? Because something untoward is being attributed towards them. Or he fears that something untoward is being attributed. Doesn't necessarily have to be some, uh, uh, sinful. Uh, you with me? Uh, for example, um, uh, uh, if I look at the word untoward, we normally, you know the students, they get married. So, you know, they get married and then I see them a week later. So then I always tell the guys, look, the last time I saw you, you were a virgin. So now the guy, you know, what happens to him? His modesty and his bashfulness, was in, he turns red in the face. So what happens? A change came about him. Um, uh, because this is not, a, you know, like having conjugal relations, not something that we talk about, like we're talking about uh, having a meal. So that's the literal meaning of the word, haya. Is everybody okay with that? insan ma yu'abu bi. And you can, you know, sometimes you don't do something. Why? Because of shyness. Bashfulness. If you think about it, that is one example I gave you, but let's break it down further and you just be khawfima yu'abubi. Out of fear of something that if it's attributed to them, it could be considered a defect. Right? So you step outside the masjid now, are you going to stand on the corner and pull down your pants and, 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 and pass water and urinate? No, you're not going to. What stops you from doing that? Your sense of modesty, your sense of bashfulness. It prevents you from doing it. Therefore, uh, the Prophet said that إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي If you are not shy, in other words, if this condition of shyness doesn't overcome you, فَفَعَلْ مَشْ Then do whatever you want to. But the moment you find that your bashfulness prevents you from doing something, and then don't do it. So it's almost like you have a natural preventative from you from doing certain things. What is that natural preventative that stops you from doing things? It's your bashfulness, and your shyness, and your modesty. Uh, now, uh, وَشَرْعًا 
خلق يبعث على اجتناب القبيح ويمنع من التقصير في حق ذوي الحق so but when we talk about bashfulness in a sharia paradigm what does it mean so the author explains to us now what is it what is it he says it is خلق it is a characteristic and this is what we want to aspire to make part and parcel of our personalities of our character so haya bashfulness is a character trait what does this character trait do يبعث على اجتناب القبيح it causes you to stay away from bad things it's a character trait that causes you to stay away from from bad things and what does it do ويمنع and it prevents you من التقصير from negligence في حق ذوي الحق in fulfilling the rights of those people that you're supposed to fulfill your rights for so in other words having this quality of haya which is that quality which will prevent you from doing the wrong thing and it will prevent you from uh, not fulfilling the rights of others that is basically what haya is so what happens is um, uh, you found that uh, if you think of an example i speak in the correction now was it abu sufyan that found himself in the company of heraclius uh, the roman king the roman emperor and then heraclius asked him about the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wasallam so abu sufyan was in front and the other the other the other um, uh, the other arabs that came with him they stood behind him so abu sufyan at that time was he was he muslim no so in other words was he in support of islam or against islam was he against islam so he he if if he had not feared that his the companions with him would 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 point out the fact that he lied then he'd have lied so what prevented him from doing that what we would refer to the quality of as haya uh at look uh, in our context you stop from doing something because what you say but khali means to say if you think about it now um you can look at it from one perspective and say but you should should leave it for the sake of allah you worry what people are going to say but the incentive for you to stop doing it is that you have at least a sense of modesty and bashfulness because if i'm going to do this what are people going to say that's exactly what stopped abu sufyan from doing a wrong thing so the fact that he had he later on became a muslim so these qualities that he had these 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 good qualities of haya which he had that availed him ultimately and he became a, a muslim so that is the quality of 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 haya so you know the 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 almost like the breakdown of these qualities because the the author is going to talk about certain qualities and particularly the negative qualities and i talked to myself firstly that we have but we haven't actually recognized and we didn't actually realize is a term for that problem that you and i have there's actually a term given to that particular vice that you and i have that we may even not even realize that we that we actually have it you know it's quite unique like for example there's a type of arrogance um uh which stems off from um uh, uh, affluence there's a type of arrogance that stems off from affluence and if you're not affluent then you cannot manifest this type of arrogance they call it batar and that's when the when the when the when the makkans came uh came out of makkah and they marched onto medina and they met at badr they came with a certain arrogance that arrogance has a certain term for it and it's called batar and batar is an arrogance which stems off from affluence so you mature in a better way and that develops a condescending attitude and an arrogant attitude within you and that's how you approach other people so you know uh, qualities like these will will we'll come across and, and the scholars dissect it for us uh, with the idea of ultimately these spiritual works are only about two things takhliya to rid ourselves of lesser qualities and tahliya to embellish ourselves with higher qualities i was want to grant us that jazakumullah uh, khairan so i think we can we can end on take some questions perhaps and then we can end on that note inshallah bi idnas wa tawakkalu
they did this one of the PC racket when people eat it they got no shame mm. look I mean uh, even in western circles they say you are what you eat I mean if we even if you look within the halal genre of things and you you, know, you eat fast foods and you know you you are what you eat I mean these are Allah created it like that and there's um, ultimately we, Allah SWT prohibited us from consuming swine we're not prejudiced towards swine but Allah SWT uh, uh, prohibited for a particular reason and we submit to that particular reason and we won't you know we 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 we, we would abstain from it uh, completely no, sure. And uh, no. Alisa, you seem to be very complacent this evening. Allah bless you. Khabar. What I understand from the question is that uh, um, many of these qualities, it's become an art. Like, uh, I can very artfully manifest humbleness and humility. And our scholars uh, they lament this. They lament it. Uh, particularly when it comes to humbleness and humility. It's an art that you can learn. And you can deceive yourself and you can deceive everybody around you also. And that form of humbleness and humility is actually one of the most um, destructive forms of arrogance. It sounds paradoxical, but it's like that. Like, for example, um, uh, if you come into a gathering, I'm just giving this example. Now, sorry. My brother, Rahimahullah, Hafizahullah, Allah grant him a long life. <laughs> 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 but you can say it also like, you know, like literally, you know, Allah have mercy on him. But normally we say it, you know, you man ingled. No, he's still uh, alive and kicking, don't worry. <laughs> I actually want to go visit him this evening. Um, uh, he had the good fortune of spending a lot of time with Muna Yusuf Karan Rahmatullahi. You know Muna Yusuf Karan? Muna Taha Karan is father. Muna Yusuf Karan Rahmatullahi. He was a giant in the true sense of the word. One of the most outstanding qualities of Muna Yusuf, he was, my brother would tell me, he was truly humble. Truly, truly, truly humble. So when he came into a gathering and he sat right at the back, he really just wanted to be there. So the example I'm talking about, Muna, you know, one of our teachers also, we were many moons ago, Muna Sulman Mullah, he just completed and he started teaching in Zakaria. So we were, you know, we were in his class. So you gave the example of that if somebody comes into a gathering, if you come into a gathering and you know you're going to be called into the front, right? It's better for you just to come straight up to the front. That would be more humble of you than to sit at the back and then have a whole f fuss and ruckus made up about you. And then the whole purpose of you being, you know, like unknown there at the back is completely defeated. You, you with me? Um, and now we can't point a finger at the person, oh, there is one of those fellows. He wants to make a, uh, make a rack. No, we can't point a finger. I'm in relation to ourselves. Uh, are you with me? So, um, and my experience, Wallahu A'lam, I found the most humble of us are the most arrogant. That's, that's, uh, my, that's I mean, I've, se I've seen that. The most humble of us are the most arrogant. And uh, may Allah grant us true humility and true humbleness. Uh, that's, you know, that's something, that, that's something else altogether. And perhaps one of the best ways to do that is to become a Naqshbandi. <laughs> I'll finish up now. I'll finish up. <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, like Alisa was talking about the kebab. I want to be a kebab. You know? So if you want to be a real kebab, like in a kebab, kebab. Like a proper kebab, kebab. Right? And then you become a Naqshbandi. I'll finish up. Everything that you don't want to do, and some of the other intuitively they know exactly what you don't want to do, they give you that to do. So, yeah, it's, 
I think it's all about, we spoke at length about it, and it's, you know, these are real things, and I speak to myself first, and we, you, but particularly the humbleness and humility, the, 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 it's become an art. <coughs> it's become an art, and there's no, there's no essence to it, it's just a form. Um, uh, if you think about, but the, 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 so there's, there's good ways of actually creating humility within yourself. And I think that's what we need to preoccupy ourselves with. Um, uh, you meet somebody, don't wait for them to greet you, you greet them. The Prophet ﷺ, um, uh, despite his great station, he, he employed means, he had humility, but to maintain his humility. What would that be? The Prophet would play with the children. That's, um, that's like a self-depreciating act. What am I doing playing with children? But it will, it will bring you down to earth and create humility and humbleness. Sitting on the ground, sitting on the floor, um, at home, you know, you, you, you the, you know, you, you, you the father of the household. But why don't you take the dish and dish everybody some food? Make sure they're sitting nice, eating everything. Give others this preference over you, yourself. Yeah. and you're doing it for yourself. You see, Molina here, and this is now I'm saying for real. You do this. Uh, you see his shoes there, so I need runs and grabs his shoes and puts it there. Not because you know of anything, but just it's it's for myself. No. Uh, your wife, even though you might not feel like it, but who you? Rub her feet. It's good for your nerves. You know, she already asked you this morning, do you love me? And you already told her a hundred times I love you. Now she asked you tonight again, just say ma one more time. Mm. Because your nerves don't want to <laughs> I told you this morning already, and then when you came home, so I told you again the second time, but now you're asking me the third time, just before we sleep, just in case, man. So you, you say it again. Anything to to break your nafs. That will lead to true humbleness and true, true humility. Um, eat your, your food, eat everything up. Something falls on the side, pick it up, blow it, and don't worry what other people think you, you, you know, you put it in your, in your mouth. Give somebody else a chance to go first, and uh, these things are done. And then, if you do that, man tawadha alila rafa'awullah. If you, if you, if you truly uh, humble yourself, and you have humbleness and humility, and then Allah SWT will, will raise you. And so those points will be like, what I'm saying here really is basically what they will say in the kitab uh, to talk about, you know, uh, humbleness. And so I think, I don't know if I'm answering your question correctly, but for me, arrogance more ties into humbleness. It's like two, you know, where we have the form of humility and humbleness, but actually it's just arrogance in that particular form, uh, which is, uh, which is, which is, which is, uh, you know, very problematic. And different of the ulama, they have their own, the ulama that we've met, I found that they're very self-depreciating. But sometimes it can give you into a... You know, Allah, this afternoon, uh, for the Salah, I came to the masjid. And I saw one of our teachers, Manna Mu'ad. He was in the masjid. He, made, uh, was, he missed Manna. He said that uh, he, Manna must have... Uh, so I told him, no, Manna, I think Manna goes back to school, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I told him, you just missed Manna. But subhanAllah, you know, I, when you speak to them, you don't know what to make of yourself also. He tells me, you make dua for me. <laughs> How can I make dua for him? So I say, well, no, you must make dua for me. You know what he tells me? Okay, inshallah, we'll make dua for each other. <laughs> I, I'm, really, I mean, he's a, another example of, mashallah, of great, great, great humility. I mean, a man of practical knowledge, man. But he's, subhanAllah. If you see him, you, you want to see him in the masjid, you want to. I read the hadith, you know, the Prophet, وسلم, if you saw him with his companions, you wouldn't be able to distinguish him from his companion. It became such an issue that they built, they, called, they call it like a, uh, I forget the Arabic term for it, like a little bit of. So the Prophet sat on there so he could be recognized. His humbleness, humility. And uh, may Allah SWT grant us that, inshallah. Barakallah <laughs> fikum. سبحان الله وبحمده سبحانك اللهم نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته